Well, ladies and gentlemen, dear president of the University of Zurich, but above all, dear president of the Zurich Insurance Group, dear Mr. Michel Lies. On behalf of the University of Zurich and the Europa Institute at the University, I would like to welcome you very warmly tonight here in the Aula Wagner, as we always say in the Churchill Aula. Um, your presentation tonight will be the first post-corona lecture, public lecture we are organizing. In doing so, and because the numbers of newly infected uh, persons in Switzerland are not really uh, encouraging to say at least we have taken a number of measures, precautionary measures. First, we allow only up to 80 people present in this big hall. Secondly, we keep a distance between each other of 1.5 uh, meters. Um, thirdly, we are wearing masks outside of the room. And fourthly, we have decided to transmit this lecture uh, live via internet to allow many people to participate and to listen to what you're going to say uh, tonight. So in this way, there are not as many people as usual here, but they are out there and listening to what you will say. These are the framework conditions within which we have to operate these days, but at least those conditions are enabling us to bring interesting people at the University of Zurich and to engage in interesting and creative dialogues within, with important people of our time. Tonight, our guest of honor is such an outstanding person. Michel Lies, chairman of the board of the Zurich Insurance Group, as well as the Zurich Insurance uh, Company. We are very happy to have you among here, us here tonight, sir. You became president of the uh, Zurich uh, Group in April 2018, after a long and outstanding career for more than 40 years in the insurance business, where you were, among others, also CEO of the Swiss Re Group. Born in Luxembourg in 1954, you soon moved to Switzerland as a student where you earned a degree in mathematics at the ETHZ next door. But of course, it is very great for our, the president of the ETHZ to learn. You then went to Brazil and joined Swiss Re in 1978, a company you then served in different positions for almost 40 years. You retired at Swiss Re as CEO in 2016 and took over your present position in April 2018. It is amazing. Wherever I mentioned during the last couple of weeks that you will be coming to Zurich University, I only heard extremely positive things about you. You seem to have an outstanding reputation among your peers, but also in a wider public. People describe you as brilliant, very friendly, not arrogant at all, very human, uh, knowledgeable, demanding leader. So in a way, the perfect president for the Zurich group. Of course, we all here would love to know how you do that. What is your secret? The Zurich Insurance Group is one of the largest insurance companies in the world with a heavy presence in the US market. Founded in 1872, so soon they're going to celebrate 150 uh, birthday, founded as a marine insurer under the name Versicherungsverein and had right from the beginning a cross-border business approach. Today, Zurich has about 55,000 employees worldwide and is doing business in more than 215 countries and territories. With this name, it's not especially 
astonishing that you have your headquarters still in Zurich. Um, and I always feel a little bit at home when I'm traveling somewhere through the world and I see the Zurich sign uh, as, as, as a symbol. Uh, very, I can very well remember in Hong Kong when you cross the harbor, you always saw this very big Zurich sign. I think meanwhile it's gone somehow, but it used to be uh, uh, very nice. With that name, your company, Mr. Lies, is probably the best interna international advertiser for our beautiful city uh, of Zurich. And therefore, it seems a natural partner for the University of Zurich. Our institute, the Europa Institute at the University of Zurich, has been enjoying a great cooperation with your companies for many years now. And is a perfect example for an academic business partnership. One of these cooperations is the yearly Zurich Lecture, where we invite a prominent speaker from the US to come here to the Zurich University and give a lecture. We had, among many, uh, two outstanding speakers here. One was Justice Scalia and the other was Justice Ginsburg, who just uh, recently has passed uh, away. Tonight you are going to talk to us about insurance Protect, prevent, provoke. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andres, and sorry to shake your hand. I should not have, but sometimes you cannot always control your emotions. Um, it's nice to speak in front of such a room. Uh, I, I must say, I need to start with an anecdote which has nothing to do with the speech I, I will give. Uh, just to explain to you that I'm used to sometimes speak in front of empty rooms. A few years ago, I was presenting the result of my previous employer, Swiss Re, in, uh, in, a, in, in an event which was organized by a bank. And the room was full of something like 50 analysts and investors. And in the middle of my speech, something like 90% of the room left. Which is not very easy, you know, when you, when you speak about something. Then you start to ask you, well, is really my speech so boring? And uh, actually, that was the moment in which the floor cap of 120 to the euro was left. And of course, all the, as these analysts had a few things to, to do outside of the presentation of Swiss Re. Just to tell you that uh, I know what it is to speak in front of a room which is probably not full, full of people, but I would like to thank you very much, all of you, to be here. I, uh, I think the risk is control, but I would like to thank you, nevertheless, very much to be here with us. So now if I press this button, that is. I won't, even if I'm a mathematician, I won't use fancy formula here, uh, this kind of formula which uh, are taught here in the university, the connection between risk and capital, the way in which you can improve your capital position according to the risk that you carry. I would like to speak more about a piece of, a little bit, the philosophy of insurance and the evolution of, uh, of insurance. And I would like to share with you some clear convictions about this industry. Conviction that, as I will say, came with the time. I didn't start working in this industry with this conviction. But first, I would like to provoke something. First provoke is the slide. And I would like to provoke by speaking of football. You may say football. In Zurich, there is definitely a connection, the FIFA center. But I would like to provoke a reaction based on this screen. Who is the greatest footballer? Messi or Ronaldo? As someone who has worked in the insurance industry for 40 years, I ask another question. If insurance was a footballer, who would it be? Messi? Ronaldo? The answer is in the picture. And it's not Messi, nor is it Ronaldo. If insurance was a footballer, it would most likely be Luka Modric. 
who is pictured on the right of this picture, this photo. Modric is a hard-working box-to-box midfielder. He does not receive the same attention as Messi or Ronaldo, nor the credit that those two players receive. But without Modric and players like him, then Messi and Ronaldo would not be as successful as they are. And that's because Modric's role is to allow other players to reach their full potential on the pitch. It's much like the insurance industry. Insurers do not occupy the limelight, and many people do not understand the importance of their role. But like Modric, insurers are enablers. Throughout history, insurers have enabled developers to build, entrepreneurs to innovate, and merchants to trade. I describe the role of insurance in three worlds, protect, prevent, and provoke. I use the same three words to describe the role of Modric. Near his own goal, Modric makes tackles to protect his team from conceding goals. In the middle of the pitch, he intercepts opposition passes to prevent attacks from forming. And closer to the opposition goal, he uses his ingenuity to provoke goal scoring chances. So how does insurance protect, prevent, and provoke? Let's have a quick tour through history. Before I do that, let me share with you a secret. I never wanted to enter the insurance industry. At university, a career in insurance was definitely not an aspiration. And it's true of many, many people, not to say all, who enter the insurance industry. No child ever says, when I grow up, I want to become an insurer. At least that's my conviction. But it is a fascinating industry. Many don't realize that insurance's pivotal impact on our world and history is enormous. I hope I can convince you of this over the next 30 minutes. Let's go back to 1666 and the Great Fire of London. The devastation meant fire risk was front of mind. It led to the birth of a new property and fire insurance industry that focused on protecting and providing protection. And what do I mean by protection? From an insurance perspective, we reimburse customers for losses. It follows a basic insurance principle, the fortunate many cover the losses of the unfortunate few. This is an important concept that I will return to. The first insurer simply paid claims to customers that had their property and contents damaged or destroyed by fire. By 1700, they realized it would be cheaper to fight fires than pay for rebuild. They began to employ firefighting units to prevent and minimize fire damage to properties insured by them. They became pioneers in prevention. It was a realization that the occurrence of some event can be influenced. This was a big step for society. Due to cultural and religious reasons, it was felt you should passively stand by and wait fate to act. And a big step for insurance, it was intervening with fate's grand plan. It worked by insuring insu issuing customers with fire marks, metal plaques, with the emblem of the insurance company. They were displayed on the front of insured buildings to allow them to be identified by the firefight units, as you can still see them, them in London today. This was also the first time we saw risk assessments. By the mid-70s, some insurers inspected properties to be insured. They would set rates based on these risk assessments. Buildings not constructed to specified standards were rejected, and rates raised for unsafe practices, such as storing combustible, combustible materials in wooden buildings. Insurance had truly entered the age of prevention. But unfortunately, this system was exposed as flawed. Despite some reciprocal arrangements, rival fire teams would ignore burning buildings once discovered it was not covered by their company. But the insurance industry overcame this. In 1833, 
10 independent fire insurance companies united to form the London Fire Engine Establishment. It was London's first fire service and it was entirely funded by the insurance companies. But over the next 30 years, the growth of the city combined with several large fires meant the fire service was too costly for the insurance industry to fund. The insurance industry needed to provoke. What do I mean by provoke? Insurance protects by reimbursing customers for losses. It prevents by offering services to avoid or minimize losses. But insurance has limits. There are losses the insurance industry cannot cover. They are called tail risk, the tail of the probability curve. Tail risk refer to events with a small probability of occurring, but if they did, they would effectively wipe out the insurance industry. The limits of insurability are caused by several factors. Among them, two, firstly, the ubiquity of the occurrence means small single losses adds up to a huge aggregate loss, for example, flood risk in a flood risk zone. And secondly, extremely high losses in one single event. This is why insurers never cover acts of war. The insurance industry could never have paid for the rebuild of Europe following World War II, for instance. The insurance industry continues to push the frontiers of insurability using innovation and technology. For instance, we can insure against earthquakes or even cyber attacks because we now have the tools to measure and therefore price this risk. But where we cannot provide insurance coverage, we can instead provoke. We can provoke actions from government, regulators and industry. Simply put, the insurance industry can indirectly provide coverage by provoking a response in others. Back in the mid-19th century, the potential for another great fire of London was considered a tail risk by insurers. Insurers. If the London fire engine establishment was to disband, then most London properties would be uninsurable. So the insurance industry companies provoked. In 1862, following the Tooley Street fire, the insurance company began to lobby the British government, saying they could not longer be responsible for London's fire safety. They wanted the government to provide a fire brigade at public expense and management. Eventually, in 1865, the British government passed the Metropolitan Fire Brigade Act and created the Metropolitan Fire Brigade. In 1904-1904, it was renamed the London Fire Brigade. The insurance industry had provoked this change. Insurance industry has provoked in other ways that have truly changed human behaviors. Let's look at one of the earliest forms of insurance, marine insurance. Chinese and Babylonian traders are believed to have developed the first risk transfer system about 4,000 years ago to support maritime trading. Shipping was a high-risk venture with storms, fire, collision, and pirates. These risks could lead to losses impacting the cargo, the ship, or both. Sea merchants wanted to transfer this risk, so the Babylonians developed an early form of marine insurance around 1750 before Christ. When a merchant received a loan to fund his shipment, an additional sum was paid in exchange for the lender's guarantee to cancel the loan should the shipment be stolen or lost at sea. Similar schemes were developed by the Phoenicians, Greeks, and Romans. Different methods to hedge marine risk evolved over the centuries, with Italian Americans particularly influential during the medieval period. But many consider the birthplace of modern insurance to be the UK in the late 17th and early 18th century. In 1688, Edward Lloyd opened a coffee house in London. It evolved to become the first marine insurance market and forerunner to Lloyd's of London that we know today. Americans 
could go bankrupt if a ship was lost at sea, but marine insurance changed this. Now they could lay off part of their risk to others, to the point where any one loss, or even a group of losses, could be borne by the wider pools of contingent capital. His insurance relied on the law of large numbers. Other ships could pool their capital to pay the loss of, say, five ships, with no one suffering losses to cause final ruin. Once again, the basic principle of insurance, the fortunate many, covered the losses of the unfortunate few. Marine insurance provided sea merchants with a form of protection on their investment. As we learned how to price risk, we could transfer more risk in the form of insurance, property, accident, and life insurance, all evolved. Insurance was not just protecting assets, it was also provoking major changes throughout the world. It provoked growth in global trade by removing maritime risk and giving confidence to investors to trade overseas. And it was provoking the growth of economies in the 18th and the 19th century. The UK had the highest density of commercial and personal insurance. This helped fuel the industrial revolution and was one of the building blocks of economic and social progress. There are many other examples in history. The famous question, would New York skyscrapers have been built at the start of the 20th century without insurance protection? Would the Hoover Dam have been built and the Panama Canal and its subsequent expansion? I mentioned the last two examples as Zurich had a proud involvement in both. Today, insurance continues to protect, prevent, and provoke. We have more ways to protect customers with different products like cyber coverage and liability insurances. And we have new protection mechanisms such as parametric insurance. This covers the probability of a predefined event happening instead of indemnifying actual loss occurred. Traditional insurance pays a claim on loss or damage to an asset, such as a property fire resulting in physical damage. But with parametric insurance, a pre-agreed payout is triggered when a parameter or index threshold is reached or exceeded. Regardless, of the actual loss sustained. For instance, it may pay out if your locality is hit by a hurricane of category four or above. A ski lift company could use parametric insurance to trigger a payout if snowfall falls below a pre-agreed level. Or a solar energy company could have a similar payout due to a lack of sunshine. Prevention has also become more sophisticated, and there is no greater emphasis on preventing losses. At Zurich, our focus on prevention has always given us a competitive edge, particularly in the commercial market, the large enterprise market. In 1882, long time ago, 10 years after Zurich Insurance was formed, we can find early evidence of a risk improvement philosophy for our customers. Zurich Frankfurt office published a brochure about protecting factory workers with a list of safety proposals. This was an early example of an insurer providing additional risk management advice designed to reduce disruption in production due to accident. The brochure covered topics like the starting procedure of steam machine, the presence of third parties on premises, and elevatory safety. In the 30s, 1930s, Zurich took prevention to a new level. Neville Peeling, CEO of Zurich America, launched the Safety Zone program as thousands of workers flocked to World War II assembly line, including women for the first time. It helped decrease workplace injuries through safety, engineering, and worker training. Zurich hired its first Zurich safety engineer in 1937 to help customers develop safe workplaces. 
In this photo from 1943, you can see attendees at a Zurich Safety Zone meeting, training event for a customer called Blue Bird Coach Lines in Ontario, Canada. As part of this program, Zurich awarded safe driver pins, depending on how many years you drove, incident free. This was the forerunner to Zurich Global Risk Engineering Network established in 1978 by Rolf Uppi. Today, Zurich has 900 specialist risk engineers who advise our customers how to protect themselves from various risks, from earthquake to cyber attacks. Prevention methods continue to evolve. Telematics in cars encourage and reward safe driving. Leak detection systems in building prevent water damage, one of the most common and costly property loss. We also advise customers on the best fire sprinklers and detection system to prevent or minimize fire damage. In past decade, we've increased our focus on natural hazards. Our risk engineers help customers prevent or minimize losses due to hurricanes, wildfires, and so on. This year we formed the Climate Change Resilience Services. It is a risk management approach that develops solutions in response to climate change related risks, such as sea level rise or temperature increase. But sadly, you cannot prevent climate change itself and only by ourselves. We can take action to reduce Zurich footprint, but our focus is on provoking action to reduce global warming. We use our expertise to educate and influence customers and public and private partners to intensify their focus on the green agenda. For instance, Zurich is advocating for a global price of carbon. We believe carbon pricing is the most effective and probably also quite simple weapon to combat climate change as it suppresses the demand on carbon intensive goods and services and stimulates investment into clean technology. We are also challenging our customers to rethink their use of carbon intense fossil fuels. And we are developing insurance in risk management solutions for new technologies, business models, and approaches to help customer transition to a carbon neutral economy. At Zurich, we dare to say that we want to support the transition to a carbon neutral economy by being a partner to those businesses that are actively transitioning. It is obvious that you cannot change from a day to another. You need a transition, and you need to accept that. And I must say I've met probably almost more convinced people by the firms who have the challenge to be transitioned to carbon neutral than the people who are simply counting the points, judging society or enterprise by enterprise. Take, for instance, BP. It is transforming itself from an international oil company into an integrated energy company. As part of its net zero ambition, BP will cut its oil and gas output by 40% and increase annual low carbon investment to 5 billion by 2030. These are the businesses that we should be supporting. And, and again, you need courage to do that. You need conviction, mainly by BP, more than by their insurer. But that's definitely the way in which I believe we can improve the situation. It is not by simply giving good points, bad points, and declaring that we do not cover the bad players, because they will find somebody else to cover them, and then the planet won't improve. I deeply believe that this transition support is one of the key tasks that we need to take very seriously. Another way to provoke this change is through our investments. With our responsible investment strategy, 
We integrate environmental, social and governance factor into our investment decision making. We were also the first private sector investor to commit to specific targets for impact investment. We call it the 555, committing to invest 5 billion to avoid 5 million tons of CO2 equivalent emissions and improve the lives of 5 million people every year. In 2019, we invested 4.6 billion in impact investment. So far, our impact portfolio has helped avoid 2.8 million tons of CO2 equivalent emissions and improve the life of 4.2 million people annually as of December 2019. Not only are we helping people and the environment, but we can also provoke change as an active shareholder. I totally accept the criticism about how do you count exactly these numbers. I can guarantee you that people are making their best to give credible and balanced figures. But it's a critique we need to accept. On the other hand, not doing anything is probably even better than you don't have number to look for. But it's, uh, this 555 is an important task for our asset managers. Here are a local example of how we have provoked people to change their lifestyle, to prevent them from becoming ill. In 1968, Zurich built the first Vita Parcours in the Frunton Quarter next to Zurich Zoo. For those unfamiliar with them, Vita Parcours are fitness trails with exercise stations that can be found across Switzerland. They allow you to mix up running or walking with strength, training or stretching. It started actually when members of a Zurich men gymnastic club in Volishofen could wood jog throughout the forest and use logs, tree stumps, and overhanging branches as gym apparatus. The club asked Zurich Life Insurance subsidiary, that time Vita, to sponsor permanent exercise station in the forest. For Zurich, it was more than a marketing opportunity. It was a prevention opportunity, as they encourage people to exercise and adopt healthier lifestyle. A cynical may say that at, time, at that time, the main challenge for the life insurance industry were life coverage, not pension. Today, there are over 500 Vita Parcours in Switzerland, and Zurich remains the main sponsor of the Vita Parcours Foundation. Although their popularity fell away in the late 80s, Vita Parcours are busy once again. This is in part due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which locked down gyms and most sporting options. Suddenly, Vita Parcours became the ideal facility to maintain fitness. Today, the insurance industry is using technology to encourage people to exercise more. The use of wearable devices adds an element of gamification to exercise and physical well-being. Zurich, along with other insurers, offers reduction in life insurance premium and others rewards to customers who maintain a healthy lifestyle. In fact, Zurich digital health and well-being proposition called Life Well is being rolled out globally after being launched in Australia last year. So the aspect of gamification is the gamification is definitely something also important. In the Vita Parcours, maybe for one generation it was enough. You come to the Vita Parcours and you exercise, now you need to be noted. You need to have a note and you need to be better tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. The world is changing. We can talk about protect, prevent and provoke without discussing the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm aware that the response of the insurance industry has generally been viewed as at best passive and probably also sometimes negative, in negative light. Some have suggested that we should have paid more claims related to travel or business interruption insurance, but pandemics are rarely covered by insurers. Sorry to say, you can read your policy and you will see that they are generally excluded. Pandemics are considered tail risk. 
Insuring them would go against the basic principle of insurance. The fortunate many cover the losses of the unfortunate few. Pandemic insurance requires the many covering the losses of the many. Premium would be astronomical. In addition, the risk of a pandemic is nearly impossible to insurers to predict, which means insurers cannot estimate potential damage caused to individual and corporation. However, however, I believe, and more than I believe, I'm deeply convinced that the insurance industry could have provoked more. It should have tried harder to warn the world about pandemic risk. Mother Nature did, did give us warning with SARS, MERS, and the Zika virus. Mother Nature gave us all these warnings. And in the World Economic Forum, risk report, to which we participate as one of the co authors highlighted that the pandemic risk was clearly highlighted. In its 2019 global risk report, it said, Outbreaks seen 2000 are a roll call of near miss catastrophes, which should be prompting increased vigilance, but is instead lulling us into complacency. The 2020 risk report repeated a similar warning. No country is fully prepared to handle an epidemic or a pandemic. Health systems, I quote, was in the report, worldwide are still underprepared for significant outbreaks of emerging infectious disease, such as SARS, Zika, and MERS. The risk of pandemics was well known. We should have shown a brighter spotlight on the risk and explained there was no insurance solution to cover pandemic losses. But it is never easy for the insurance industry to warn about potential new risk. We get accused of scaremongering or trying to drum up business. But the insurance industry is still provoking change. We are influencing and supporting government to create state-backed pooling mechanism to cover pandemic losses. It's already operating in many countries, such as the National Flood Insurance Program, and the terrorist risk insurance program in the US. Agriculture insurance is also subsidized in many countries. Nuclear accidents are also usually insured through a government-sponsored program, and it is what the insurance industry is trying to provoke when it comes to pandemics. Because in there are cases where we can protect or prevent, we naturally try to provoke. I would like to insist on the fact that it's probably sometimes difficult for us to speak about the risk because it can be seen as simply explaining the next business plan that we have. But I, I, I strongly believe that we should not be sh too, much, too shy about that. And uh, it's an interesting observation that I have is that the political horizon is probably not exactly the same horizon as the horizon of, of an insurer or even a reinsurer. And, uh, large risk, strong, big risks are normally touching you with less frequency than elections, meaning that it's, it's sometimes difficult to convince people to take these risk management approach at the political level. And it's a, it's a challenge that we need to give to ourselves to convince more people that risk management is an important task, especially if you're heading a company. Before I move to the Q&A, let's go back to football. Since 2008, only two players have won the Ballon d'Or, a prestigious award presented to the football player considered the best in the world. Messi has won it six times, Cristiano Ronaldo five times, probably very jealous, except for one year, 2018. That player was Luka Modric. Finally, it was recognized that the best player can have other attributes beyond goals scored and goals created. It gives me hope that one day people may begin to understand and appreciate the key role played by the insurance industry to protect, to 
prevent and to provoke. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, Michel Liège, for this great presentation. Um, I, I never thought before, really, about you know insurance industry and to provoke. Uh, that, that was not in my in my mind somehow. But it was interesting to learn, and we probably should listen more to insurance companies because you somehow have a kind of a radar system, and you see what what kind of threats and dangers are are coming up. So thank you very very much for this uh, great lecture. Now I would like to invite those present in the room. Uh, unfortunately, those at home cannot participate in the discussion round yet um, to ask questions uh, they might have um, to Michel Lies, please. Yeah, please. There's a question far in the back. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your speech. So you like told us right, right before that um, insurances can provoke also new changes regarding pandemics. So what would be like an example what insurances can like provoke regarding the COVID pandemic or other pandemics? Because I don't really have a straight example in my mind. So I would be really happy to receive like just one example what that could be because I can't think of anything. Thank you. I'm not sure I understood the question. You mean in the case of pandemic, we can provoke the way, what I wanted to say about the pandemic is that definitely we cannot change the risk as such now that it is there. We could have provoked earlier by saying people, you need to be prepared to something that will come. But that's quite complicated. And once we accept that the risk cannot be totally covered by the insurance industry because the capital is not enough, you need to set up a scheme with the state, which exists in, in other kind of risk, in which by layers, I would say the private sector takes something and uh, and then there is a certain state state guarantee that if i take another example as pandemic i believe that uh, climate risk is, is probably one of the best examples in which we can play a role we we have sometimes the the tendency to be used by others in order to because you know in climate risk you need some time to take decisions which are not politically very popular so it's easier to convince the finance sector not to support some kind of industry instead of simply giving the rules to the industry. But to come, to come on, on, the, on the real problem, the, on, the, on the climate risk, I do believe that the way in which we can price also some of the risk, the way, the way in which we, we exclude the cover for some of the industry not wanting to change is definitely a, a, a nice provocation. But I would like to conclude by provoking on the fact that it's nice to have ideas and radical ideas. The world cannot change from one day to the other. We need to credibly assist the people who are really, truly doing the transition. And that's something which is sometimes difficult to explain. Those people do not believe that it is really honest. But I, I, I deeply believe it is honest by many, many of the big firms today. They want to change, but they cannot change from one day to the other. And that's something in which uh, I think we, we need also probably to be accept to be to be provoked by others and to to explain what we want to do. I've learned that in the past we haven't listened carefully enough to what insurance companies are telling us about upcoming risks. Right now, beside global warming and pandemics, could you share another risk that we haven't been aware of really so far and that might come? It seems, it seems that the sun may send us sometimes waves which are destroying all the electronic on our planet. That, that's something which is also a risk. But it's, it's, it's fair to say that uh, there, are, there are phases in the insurance industry, and let's be honest, you need to have a clear perception about what is the risk, but also a clear understanding about the perception of the risk. And when the risk is above the perception, there is no business for the insurance. Mm. When the perception is above the risk, there is business for the insurance. So it, it is always a, a very complicated mix between trying not to speak too much about business opportunity for the industry, but trying to be understood as an honest front runner of the risk we are running. And uh, he, I, 
I'm just a little bit frustrated on the fact that we have been, I think, supporting now for more than 10 years the risk report of the World Economic Forum in Davos. Nothing has happened on this planet which was not described. But sometimes you get the impression you put that on a fantastic table, job done, and everybody knows, and uh, if it happens, it happens, we can show it was there. I think we need to do a little bit more. It's complicated because, again, it is simply, in a way, scaremongering for our job. But I believe that it is, it is a task that we need to take more seriously, to provoke reaction on things that we anticipate instead of expecting that they happen, to just realize that sometimes they are tail risk and they cannot even be covered by the insurance industry. I saw another question back there and then... Don't want to touch it. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for the presentation. I'm thinking about the, 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 the term provoke. I mean, you, you put the definition. And I guess it all goes around leadership and inspiring. So you don't force people to change. You have to convince them. The perception has to be above the risk. That's very clear. And in this sense, you know, in, in today's world where we see that uh, leaders around the world uh, come short or below the perception of what scientists seem to be uh, calling for years and not be heard, uh, how do, do you see the, I mean, the lessons learned from big corporates like Zurich, Swiss Re, that they have an internal governance? To what extent, what are the lessons learned from big corporates and how they function that could be taken outside the corporate world and create the partnerships with public, uh, private partnerships to really take provocations to uh, the next step of for actions? And um, yeah. We leave it there, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, you know, when you speak, th th there is a concept which has been introduced first in the insurance industry, which is the so-called chief risk officer. And you would say chief risk officer should have existed by insurance companies for years, if not centuries. I think it was introduced by the insurance industry less than 20 years ago. Chief risk officer. Uh, so, so the lesson learned for me is definitely that even a company which is living of risk is introducing the concept of chief risk officer only under 30 years after being created. But from that, we, we dynamized ourselves in order to get the provocation possibility to go to government and to say that there is something that should be definitively put on the front agenda, top of the agenda of many, many government, it's the so-called country risk management. We've tried it, and, and I would say I've tried it personally because we created a unit at Swiss Re in order to achieve that. And uh, my biggest frustration was to visit so many finance ministers because uh, at the end you need to go to the finance minister because he's always the one approving the project, who, to be honest, has a, a very clear view about financial risk but do not care about the others. Uh, but you go to these ministers and 99.9% .9 of these ministers are either professional politicians or ex-bankers. You never, ever meet an insurer. Which, well, you can understand, but if we once understand that country risk is something important to be put in the agenda of the governments, uh, I, I do believe that we, we, sh we should have more presence of risk managers. Let's call them risk managers for a while in this level of our heading politicians. And uh, I, I do believe that uh, the, the, this aspect of risk management has been not put probably at the level it should have been put by the political leadership. And I do feel partly responsible for that because it's also probably the result of an industry which has for many, many years thought, in order to be happy, let's leave hidden. You know, I will conclude by telling you that uh, Mr. Kafka, I suppose you know the literature of Mr. Kafka, 
which is not exactly the most exciting literature, Mr. Kafka was an employer of an insurance company in Prague. So uh, th there is definitely something there, and that's what I've tried to explain now. There is something you never enter in insurance by passion, that you can really acquire it, that we need now to spread it out. And we have not yet achieved that, and I think it's extremely important, because it's a challenge for the democracy to deal with this kind of long-term risk, taking into account that you need to be rechosen by your people each four, five, or six years. So th there, there is something that we need to find, because this long-term view is probably one of the biggest challenge that the political system called democracy, for which I'm a big fanatic, uh, is, is exposed to. Because you, you, you have a tendency then to be a little bit short-term when you explain to your people uh, the problem that they have to face. So I see there are next future career step for you, right? Entering politics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in Luxembourg, maybe I have a chance. <laughs> I had a few famous people there. Uh, Christian? Well, thank you very much. So um, my question is rather science related. I'm um, by training a, a lawyer and a criminologist. And so in recent times we have um, developed into something like predictive policing and uh, quantitative criminology that tries to forecast risks. So my question is, um, do you believe in, in this tendency to rely more and more on data and uh, does it make our forecasts and predictions more precise or does it confuse us and, and uh, do we depend too much on, on data? This is my first question. Second one, uh, what is next on your provoke list? Is it cybercrime? Is it cybersecurity? Uh, you just mentioned uh, kind of electromagnetic impulses or something. So what, what is kind of like your ranking in the risks uh, that we should pay attention to? On the first, of course, we, we do believe that uh, data and the way in which we use data is extremely important to understand the risk and uh, it, it, can bring, it can bring a lot if the data are the solid data. It's probably also fair to say that we are not an exception to other industries that we see also data as a, as a weapon to capture a client, to understand better client needs and to, and to react to their needs. So, the data, the, the, the big data challenge or the big data opportunity is on one side probably to better understand some of the risks, but probably also to better understand some of the, of the needs. So it has a touch, if I may say, a little bit of, uh, of, of marketing, and we are not an exception. Everybody does see the big data uh, as, as that. And, and that can be, by the way, a way also of finding the best way to provoke some of the people if you want to create some, some reaction. On anticipating the risk, it's always a little bit dangerous. It's, 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 it's our task, it's probably more our task than the one of the politician. You, you probably remember the famous movie Minority Report in which you arrest people simply because the system is telling you that the guy is committing, will commit a crime today, tomorrow. <laughs> a little bit complicated in the legal environment that we have currently. To come back on your, on your other question, you know, we, we can have uh, the famous black swan scenario and uh, can spend an evening speaking of, of that. I, I, I would say I would prefer to see the, the emerging scenario, what, what is happening to us now with this pandemic, not bringing us away from, from the climate challenge. But I think instead, because I sometimes got the impression that creating new uh, New, new reason to be, to be afraid is, is simply bringing us away of the, the concrete task that we have to take very seriously, the one that we have in front of us. And, and I do believe that we have a serious one in front of us. I know there are a lot of debate, but I do believe that the climate story is, is something important. Uh, it's complicated again because uh, you, you see the political evolution. There is now a a tendency also to negate these kind of things. And that's probably one of the difficulties also of the data, that anybody can find all the data to convince, to demonstrate his theory. So it's terrible. You don't, you don't, you don't know exactly how to believe the data. I think the integrity of the data is one of the key elements. But my, my main concern is uh, to take seriously what is coming to us, but it should not deviate us from taking very seriously the global challenge that we have about climate. 
you have been working for almost 40 years for the same employer. Yes. And that used to be the standard. Specifically, Sri Sri was famous for that. You entered a company, you left, and you went into the pension. This has changed nowadays, right? Um, did, did insurance and banks and other companies lose something, you know, based on that development, that, that nowadays people come in, they do not identify themselves maybe as they used to do, being a proud Zurich, being a proud Swiss Re employee? I think you have, in, in large companies, you have the opportunity to make very, very different things in the same company. So that, that, that's something, doing the same thing would have been disastrous in a way. Uh, we, we are also probably an industry in which we still need to progress with uh, all the academical force that we have around us to educate more people to, to become insurer. But it's, as I say, uh, if no child wants to be an insurer when he's a child, it's quite logical that you don't have a lot of insurance education in the university. So that's something in which if the university can probably assist us to create this kind of passion about the fact that it's an all-runner and somebody uh, really that, that can, can do things, I think we can attract more people. We will see definitely a, a lot of our profession changing. We, we know that. We don't know uh, who, who it will be. But I, uh, I, I do believe that there is definitely also for the insurance industry a, a role of trying to anticipate exactly what you describe in order not to make of all the people who cannot see the digital world in a positive fashion, simply people who are frustrated. Mm. I think the debate is, is enormous there. And uh, I, uh, I, I strongly believe that that's, that's a piece in which the insurance industry can play a role by identifying tasks in which some of these people transitioning again. As I said for PP, transitioning. But it's fair to say that uh, we do not count anymore in the future with an enormous army of people who will join us with 25 and remain until 65. Mm. And I don't believe that's bad. Okay. Maybe I have time for one last question. Michael? Michel, you, you protect, you prevent, and when you cannot protect and prevent, you provoke. Are there situations where you identify risks where you should provoke but you won't because it's going against business interests? I don't know. Political risk, for example, where you decide that provoking governments might not be a good business proposition? Well, it depends on the country. You know, I have the chance to live in a country in which you can bring proposal, uh, discuss them, and, and I agree sometimes to disagree, but in, in, a, in a constructive fashion, and sometimes also modifying the provocation into something positive. So there are definitely countries in which provoking can be dangerous, especially with you, with you, if you speak about politician uh, accountability. But uh, I must say in the majority of the cases in which we try to bring solution simply putting on the table that it cannot be a pure private insurance solution, we normally can start the discussion. I do not say that we find a solution for everything, but we can start the discussion. And uh, I'm, I cannot guarantee that it will be like that in the future. I, I can see uh, definitely large, large countries on which the debate about uh, climate change is, is not exactly of the quality I, I would hope. That, that's, that's a fair point, and that's always the problem with humanity. We have a tendency to get a little bit away from scientific data, and again, the abundance of data is giving a lot of argument to anybody, and then we become religious. And uh, when something becomes religious, nothing against the religion, but when something becomes religious, there's no consensus possible anymore. And, and that's negative. And we are not exactly going in the right direction in the current environment. Michel Lies, thank you so much for this presentation and the very engaged question and answer session. Thank you. That was a, a, great, a great speech. Thank you so much. Uh, we have to come. One second. We have to come to an end now, and um, uh, we also thought about a little uh, gift for you. Uh, of course, we couldn't give you this Sprüngli stuff there coming from Luxembourg. That's not possible. So we picked something else. We, we do these Churchill lectures, and so we, we, we have for you a, a bottle of Churchill champagne, so the champagne that Churchill always, you know, liked most, and a little secret from your 
assistant is that you uh, like also some specific cigars, not Churchill cigars, and that's also for you. Thank, Thank you, you so very, much. Very, very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just add to those you know on the internet that we will have more lectures this fall, and specifically on the 23rd of October, we'll, we'll have Michel Barnier, the, the chief negotiator for the EU with Great Britain, and he's coming to talk to us about lessons learned, and we will be interested to learn what he, what kind of lessons he learned. So thank you very much, also the people in the internet at home, and uh, come back next time. Thanks. <laughs>